Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. Downside surprise on CPI, upside surprise on retail sales. Is that good news or bad news? Equities down, the countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue, waiting for growth to crack. We're going to see the growth slow down. Our expectation in 2023 is that markets are going to begin to focus on economic growth. We're going to move towards growth being a larger concern. We're going to see pretty sluggish GDP for a while. The key issue at the moment is the sequencing of hitting the Fed's dual mandate. The investable windows are really, really short. This is not a time to get too cute. It's the window between, hey, inflation looks like it's peak. We have seen now inflation come down. And uh-oh, you know, the unemployment rate is rising and other, other forms of economic growth are slowing. That's going to give cover for the Fed to pause in, in Q1. The big risk for, though, that we see is that the, the lags between monetary policy tightening and the effects in the real economy. I don't think you catch it fast enough until the second half of the year. You're going to see a, a big lag and that's going to be a bigger problem it's going to be very difficult for markets to digest this economy is not breaking yet joining us now is jp morgan's oksana aronoff morgan stanley's michael kushma oksana first to you downside surprise on cpi upside surprise on retail sales isn't that what we want to see well, uh, it's interesting. In the preceding segment, you uh, ran through a number of people who are talking about the expectations of a slowdown as we move towards 2023. And yet, this is, what, the fourth pivot rally that we've seen so far this year. And yes, you know, the Fed's job is not being made any easier by all of this different data. Um, the stronger retail numbers today give them more cover to continue to be aggressive, which is what they have consistently telegraphed, right? I think uh, Jerome Powell left no doubt whatsoever that he prefers to err on the side of more tightening as opposed to less tightening because uh, more tightening he feels he can undo with easy monetary policy, whereas less tightening is an error that will take years potentially to undo. Neil Dutta of Renaissance Macro on the same page as you. He said out on Twitter, it puts the market's estimation of the terminal interest rate at risk. As Paul has said, we don't know what the path will be, but we know it will be enough. Michael Kushma, how do you think about that, the risk that the terminal rate has to go even higher? Well, I think what, what we've seen today with lower inflation, higher retail spending is indicative of, of the risk of higher short-term rates farther out. Inflation is coming down. We're seeing goods price disinflation. Certainly one major factor holding back spending has been high prices of things, whatever you were looking to buy or the inability to actually buy it. As inflation comes down, supply chains continue to loosen. People are confronted with lower prices and availability. Spending could actually be firm. And we're seeing that in the second half of this year, of the economy is going to be accelerating relative to Q2 into 2023. We're trying to work out the gap between inflation rolling over and growth getting smashed. And that's been a theme on this program over the last 48 hours or so. We caught up with Jared Woodard of Bank of America. Take a listen to what he had to say. The big risk that we see is that the, the lags between monetary policy tightening and the effects in the real economy could be much longer than investors have priced in. I think you're, you're going to see a, a big lag, and that means it's going to be very difficult for markets to digest both slowing growth and tighter financial conditions at the same time. Oksana, let's say that weakness is pushed out further into 2023. The real big, profound cracks in the economy, in the distance, on the horizon, out into, I don't know, the first half, second half of 23, whatever it is. What do you do in between, Oksana? So I think this is a really important point, John, uh, which is that uh, it's sort of irrelevant. I know there's so much emphasis on, you know, has inflation peaked? We frankly don't know. We had a similar feeling, or the market did, wasn't my view, but the market did in the summer, and then we resumed the, the trend upward. So we really don't know. And it's sort of irrelevant because, of course, there are significant lags to Fed policy, um, you know, lags as long as 12 to 18 months. And so we won't really see the full effect of this tightening probably until, you know, possibly even the midpoint of next year. And if you think about the those lags being, you know, 12 months long or so, where was the Fed 12 months ago? They were fully in easing mode. And so this past quarter was really the first time that we saw inklings 
of the Fed's tightening have an, an impact on earnings? Of course, you know, Target most prominently coming out this morning with a pretty dreadful report, right? And so we're going to continue to see that. And I think, uh, when, to your question, what do you do between now and then? You stay very defensive because nothing has really broken in this market yet. And this Fed is not getting involved until it does, and even then, only if inflation is fully under control, which is absolutely not where we are at this time. So stay very defensive. Push that through the bond market, Oksana. The inversion we've got on twos versus tens right now at negative 63. How much further negative can that go? So we actually think the curve will start to flatten out at, at some point. And uh, again, you know, irrespective of, of that, what we really should be prepared for as investors is that there's going to be more pain, certainly on the corporate credit uh, side of the market, where earnings will continue to get squeezed. And there will be really great entry points at that time. I know that right now the favorite trade seems to be, you know, buy longer term treasuries because that's going to protect you should that recession uh, materialize, you know, a word that the Fed is all but outright saying that that is essentially what they're playing for. But, you know, I'm not so convinced because the only reason to buy 10 year duration here is certainly not because you're picking up yield because, as you said, the curve is inverted. The only reason to buy it is if you believe the Fed will start cutting and you're going to sort of accrue that appreciation. That has been the case in past cycles. And I'm not so sure the Fed will be free to do so again if inflation stays elevated. And that doesn't even mean it needs, means it needs to stay at 8%. It could be at 4 or 5, and the Fed will not be free to really cut. And you can have more of a stagflationary scenario in which, you know, that longer term bond is not really the safe haven that everyone expects it will be. Michael Kushma, your reaction, sir? It's a, a similar view that this bull, bull, flattening we've seen of late with relaxation of um, uh, expectations of Fed rate hikes seems premature. There's still a lot of uncertainty how things are going to play out in the next couple of quarters. And particularly, lower inflation, easier supply chains could lead to stronger spending and a harder job for the Fed to rein things in. So that I expect the curve to kind of re go back to kind of where it was. You know, 10 year treasuries where they are now seem on, on the low side relative to where they should be. I think over 4% is a more realistic level to, to buy or to own duration um, in this in this environment that is too much optimism that, that we're going to have a soft landing next year. Rafael Bostic echoed some of that. The Atlanta Fed president said this, there is considerable uncertainty about how these policy lags will play out. We're still learning about an economy that is rapidly changing. It can take many months for these decisions to take effect and for the economy on and on prices as well. Mike McKee, your thoughts? <laughs> well, the data we got this morning certainly backed that up, the idea that the Fed doesn't know exactly what's going to happen because the economy is rapidly changing. Look at the retail sales figures. Very strong. 1.3 percent after a flat reading in September. Now, some of that is inflation, but a lot of it is uh, people still buying stuff. The retail control group, which goes into GDP, up seven-tenths an increase from September. And then you look at the uh, import prices, ex-petroleum, because that's very volatile, down two-tenths of a percent. Autos in the retail sales report up 1.3 percent. This may be a lot about cars because, of course, Florida had two hurricanes insurance paying off and maybe people buying new cars, gas prices we knew would be up. But look at groceries, still strong. Department stores surprisingly weak, but that is uh, coming after the after back-to-school sales. Non-store retailers, the Internet guys, 1.2 percent. And the only services thing in the uh, categories here, 1.6 percent for eating and drinking, which is the most discretionary of all. So if people were feeling bad or thought they didn't have money, that is uh, where they would cut back. And look at this number. Came out yesterday, the New York Fed credit card usage in the third quarter. That shows credit cards are becoming a bigger and bigger part of retail spending, which does suggest that stimulus money is running out and maybe uh, we're going to see people running up their credit cards to try to keep up the spending and then uh, they get a bill and they decide we're not going to spend anymore. But that's Still to be seen. And the dilemma is summed up this morning uh, and last night by uh, Esther George, the Kansas City Fed Bank president, who said she's not in her 40 years seen a time of this kind of tightening that she didn't get some painful outcomes. In other words, a very rising unemployment rate. And then look at what Target said today. Lousy third quarter, $3 yep. billion dollar restructuring. And they say, yeah, but we're not planning any layoffs. It was so hard to find workers 
after the COVID uh, pandemic that people aren't letting people go. Well, how does that change the dynamic for the Fed? This is going to play out over several months and be really interesting. By the way, John, this morning, uh, Michael Froley over at J.P. Morgan said they expect another 100 basis points of tightening from another the Fed 100 and a recession next year. Five handle on Fed funds. Yep. They're all looking for that. I remember someone said weeks ago, you can't fire what you couldn't hire. Mike McKeon, that seems to be the theme in corporate America. Mike, you mentioned Target. In the pre-market, that's down by more than 15%. Compare and contrast what we got from retail sales 40 minutes ago and what we heard from the Target CEO just before that. In the latter weeks of the quarter, sales and profit trends softened meaningfully with guest shopping behavior increasingly impacted by inflation. Can you compare and contrast that, Mike, for us? Well, you look at Walmart, and Walmart didn't have any problem with those things. Uh, there was some retail analysis out this morning that said Target may be something of an outlier. Now, interesting thing is that uh, these are all sort of the lower price level stores that are reporting now. And so maybe what we're seeing is people buying more groceries and fewer uh, you know, bits of apparel and things like that uh, because their discretionary income is being squeezed a little bit. That stock getting hammered. We'll pick up on that around the opening bell. Oksana Aronoff, Michael Kushman, back with us for a final thought. Oksana, you said there would be better entry levels. Can you describe them to me? What does that look like and how the hell do you know when it's the right time to come back into this market? <laughs> So uh, if we look at just simply history and if we look at parts of the bond market that tend to that tend to break first. Right. And that's certainly the lower rated credit issuer. What we see there are spreads in the mid 400s and that's below the 20 year average, let alone below a recession average, which, te which tends to run in the high 800s, low 900s, irrespective of how shallow or benign that recession is. So we have not really seen any pain there. And it's really telling um, and concerning, frankly, to me that we saw, you know, last Thursday when this sort of rally really ripped, we saw two and a half billion dollars go into high yield ETFs and they have now garnered something like 22 percent of their AUM since just the mid-October. And this is all happening as downgrades are taking over upgrades in that sector as again we're just starting to see that sector really reckon with a new order of higher cost of capital and this is not a part of the market that really can thrive when capital is expensive given that these are junk issuers so i think you know using that as just sort of one example of the kinds of entry points that we will see as some of this pain does start to take toll on earnings and, and margins, et cetera. So we will absolutely have better entry points um, in the coming weeks and, and months, but it's going to take some time. In the meantime, we do see pockets of um, you know, markets that are breaking. You know, if you look at the CLO market, if you look at pockets of the mortgage credit market, if you look at some closed end funds, you know, you do see these sort of isolated canaries in the coal mine, um, and that is going to spread more wide. Um, and that contagion will continue. And look, we're not describing something akin to a 2008 type event. Sure. But certainly liquidity concerns will enter this market again. And certainly there will be better entry points as the reality of the higher cost of capital continues to just grind down earnings. And we are just at the beginning of this process. And again, whether inflation has peaked or not is irrelevant to that reality that we're going to have to live with this for the next months and you know possibly even a couple of years. Michael Kushman, I've got 30 seconds for you, sir. Final word. This this year has been about rate increases, not about corporate default probabilities increasing, et cetera. The economy has been overall weak, but household and corporate balance sheets have been in really, really good shape. Everyone turned out their debt. Rising interest rates is not affecting balance sheet or financial health. Therefore, rates have heard, impacted rate sensitive sectors like the mortgage market, housing market things like that. But overall, the default risk, earnings risk is next year's problem, not this year's problem. So the rally we're seeing in credit, in high yield and investment grade is not likely to be sustained next year with spreads getting back to a more normal level at a time of a very heightened uncertainty with regard to the outlook for the economy, certainly in the, la the latter half of next year. So overall, I'd be pretty defensive, getting more defensive now and, and take advantage of the rally to lighten up risk in anticipation that next year is going to be a rockier road with regard to credit. Michael, Oksana, to the both of you. Two of the best in fixed income. Great to catch up. These moves in bonds today. Two's tens, negative 63 basis points. That curve going even more negative. Coming up, the panic over Russia tensions receding. You have no indication that this was the result of a deliberate attack. You have no indication that Russia is preparing offensive military actions against NATO.
We'll touch base with MH and Maria up next. We agreed to support Poland's investigation into the explosion in rural Poland near the Ukrainian border. And I'm going to make sure we figure out exactly what happened. And then we're going to collectively determine our next step as we investigate and proceed. There was total unanimity among the folks at the table. It's unlikely in the minds of the trajectory that it was fired from Russia. But we'll, we'll, we'll see. Attention shifting from Bali to Poland, escalation fears easing following an explosion near the Polish-Ukrainian border. We have no indication that this was the result of a deliberate attack. We have no indication that Russia is preparing offensive military actions against NATO. Our preliminary analysis suggests that the incident was likely caused by a Ukrainian air defense missile fired to defend Ukrainian territory against Russian cruise missile attacks. This coming as world leaders wrap up G20 meetings and President Biden returns to a lame duck Congress. Our team coverage begins right now with Anne-Marie over in Bali and with us from Brussels is Maria Tadeo. MH, first to you. The events of the last 24 hours, what are the lessons learned? I think the lessons learned are that uh, the U.S., along with the G7 leaders and the NATO leaders, really wanted to work on making sure they had the facts right before they escalated a situation uh, that was obviously incredibly worrisome. And really what you saw from this morning to right now this evening is really uh, the Western alliance moving back from the brink. There was discussion of Article 4, discussion of Article potentially 5 lingering out there. But what they did and what the president discussed with reporters was that they wanted to wait for the assessment to be done. And that's what they did. And what they found out was that Jonathan, this was uh, the preliminary investigation. This was a Ukrainian defense missile that was warding off a Russian missile. Now, one thing that is very clear, whether it's Chancellor Olaf Scholz, whether it's President Biden, whether it's Jens Stoltenberg, is that they say Russia in the end bears responsibility because, of course, this is the nine month of the war in Ukraine, and that's Putin's war in Ukraine and his invasion. Maria, there is a tweet from the Ukrainian foreign minister that is still up from 16 hours ago that says Russia now promotes a conspiracy theory that it was allegedly a missile of Ukrainian air defense that fell on the Polish territory, which is not true, except we found out that preliminary investigations suggest it might be. What's your take on that? Look, Jonathan, it, it's very difficult here because you have to understand the political situation, just the emotional situation in Ukraine right now is very difficult. Uh, we need some context here. Yesterday was a terrible day uh, for Ukraine. This country was pounded uh, by Russia and what looks like retaliation for isolation at the G20. And of course, the fact that the Ukrainian army was able to get back heads on, that was humiliating for the Russian army. So this is a country that is still reeling in so many ways for what was yesterday just just a pounding uh, across the country. Now, the Ukrainians, of course, are always very sensitive to this perception that maybe they are the bad ones or the ones that do not do everything correctly or the right way. And this is why you see, uh, well, the Ukrainians, to some extent, on the passive aggressive saying, well, do not buy anything that Russia says. How can you believe that Russia says it was Ukrainian air defense and take their words? Moscow lies all the time. But I should say something. The fact that this was a Russian uh, missile air defense does not mean that Russia does not bear responsibility. This goes back to what Amory said. A lot of this is happening because of Russian actions. It doesn't mean that Ukraine doesn't have a right to defend itself. But of course, the country is a bit of an, on the passive aggressiveness today. It's a tough one. Maria, thank you. Alongside AMH, two of the very best on this story over the last 12 months, that's for sure. Ed Mills with us now, down in Washington, Washington mm -hmm. policy analyst at Raymond James. Ed, I want to talk to you about the Washington that the president returns to and the support or lack thereof that there will be in Congress to support funding Ukraine's effort to defend its territory? Well, John, I think he returns to a Congress that will absolutely continue the funding. I do think it would have been different if Republicans uh, made more gains, especially in the House. 
Uh, you did see some of these questions that were coming up pre-election, not only from the MAGA Republicans, but also from the progressive Democrats. Uh, but I think the lesson from the election was uh, the middle held. The middle is what is going to govern over the next two years. And the middle continues to support um, the efforts in Ukraine. And the you know, incidents yesterday are thankfully seemingly like an accident, but it is a reminder of just how close we are to escalation. And that will redouble kind of efforts and support here in D.C. Uh, for the support of Ukraine and against Putin and Russia. And a reminder in the last 24 hours as well over how divided this Republican might be, Republican Party might be in the House. Ed, your take on the former president announcing that he is going to run for 2024 and the announcement we had from Stephen Schwartzman of Blackstone in Axios today that he probably won't be supporting him. Yeah, John, this has been a remarkable kind of week for a lot of reasons, but it has been a coordinated effort uh, by Republicans and from the media uh, that have supported Republicans to tell Donald Trump that they do not want him to be the nominee in 2024. Ultimately, that's clearly up to voters. If there is something that I hear from Republicans here in D.C. about the 2024 election in President Trump's emergence, is if he does not get the nomination, would he run as a third party candidate? Does that help out Democrats in the 2024 elections ultimately? Clearly, it's too early to kind of tell on a lot of these things, uh, but his emergence uh, is not a welcome sign, at least from Republicans uh, that I speak to here in D.C. Ed, the primaries will be fascinating, and I think I'm probably underplaying it on the Republican side. Do you think we will have primaries on the other side? If President Biden decides to run for re-election, uh, there might be a primary, but I think he would have the opportunity to kind of relatively easily capture the nomination, especially after how he did in the midterms uh, and, and chucking up some you know, surprising wins over the last two years with a very small house in a 50-50 Senate. Uh, clearly, if he decides to step aside, um, we will have a very robust primary. Uh, is it the vice president? Is it some of his cabinet members? Plenty of governors and senators would also enter the race. Uh, so it's going to be a fascinating couple of years here. Looking forward to covering it with you. Ed, I know you've had a super busy morning. Thanks for dropping by the studio for us. Ed Mills there. Equity futures down four tenths of 1% on the S&P. Up next, your morning calls and later, Target hammered. Equities down. Let's get you some morning calls this morning. Jeffrey's cutting their Apple estimates, saying it's taking a weekly revenue hit of $1 billion due to lockdowns. Evercore adding Etsy to its underperform list, expecting customers to shift their spending to cheaper items. And finally, Raymond James downgrading Home Depot, highlighting a number of challenges in the year ahead. That stock is down by about 1% in the pre-market. Up next, Target plunging after earnings and sounded the alarm on the U.S. consumer. That conversation up next with Troy Gersky of FS Investments. We're processing a ton of information. CPI downside surprise, PPI downside surprise, retail sales really punchy. Upside surprise, equities down by four tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by seven tenths of 1% over the last week. The rally in that one has been monstrous. That's the equity market, that's the opening bell. Switch on the board and get to the bond market. Yields look like this on a 10 year. A 10 year treasury yields lower by five basis points, 371.94 and the dollar weaker once again, Euro dollar, 104. In the commodity market, we're down 2% on crude, $85 and about 11 cents. And the only stock to watch right now around the opening bell, about 10 seconds in, is Target. And Target is getting hammered. We're down by more than 16% at the open. Target's results fueling concerns about the U.S. consumer this morning. The CEO, Brian Cornell, had this to say. In the latter weeks of the quarter, sales and profit trends softened meaningfully. Kaylee Lyons, every time Brian Cornell smoked this morning, it was bad news after bad news. Kaylee, we've got to turn your mic on. We're going to sort that out in just two seconds' time. And when we work that out, I'll bring you back into the conversation and we can talk some more about Target. Troy Gersky is with us now. Troy, I'm going to come to you on Target. And what we've heard from Target this morning, which is just bad, 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 and what we've heard from retail sales, which was 
pretty good. Mix it all yeah. up, Troy. What do you get? Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the points of this cycle that's so interesting is that, you know, remember the U.S. consumer, because they were flush with cash, as well as a hyper tight labor market really up until the summer, you know, has been keeping the U.S. and global economy afloat throughout a very uh, tough period. Um, and that continues to upside surprise. And as you were talking about earlier today on surveillance, you know, the, the more resilient the consumer remains, you know, the, the harder the Fed goes in terms of tightening policy. So, so we could stay in this more inflationary environment for longer because the labor market and uh, the consumer have been incredibly resilient. That being said, if you think about Target's results, it really just reemphasizes that, you know, it's not necessarily a wily e. Coyote moment, but at the same time, the consumer can't keep it going single-handedly forever. And as the labor market gradually softens and unemployment goes up, not only are you going to have disappointing earnings at the corporate level, but ultimately next year, you know, in agreement, uh, in agreement with Dudley, it's almost inevitable that we end up in a recession because the U.S. consumer with a softer labor market with unemployment going up cannot single-handedly keep the global economy going forever. So, Troy, how wide do you think the window is? And this is my question at the moment this week. How big is that window between evidence of inflation rolling over, and we're getting signs of it at the moment, and growth cracking? How long is it before this takes place? Yeah, so if you asked us three months ago, we would have thought it was, you know, Q1 to Q3 uh, is when we finally have, quote unquote, a true recession where um, unemployment actually goes up meaningfully and consumption rolls over. Because without job creation, income growth and, and higher debt uh, levels and inflation, it's inevitable that consumption rolls over. Now it's looking more like a Q2 to Q4, maybe even as late as Q1 of 2024. So we're wow. going to stay... Yeah, no, it, it, the lag is, is quite profound, right? And, and again, if you look at the data, and one of the data points we always follow very closely uh, is withholding tax growth. So that's rolled over hard, but it's still at relatively healthy levels compared to the post-pandemic era of you know mid to low high single digits. So again, is uh, first of all, job growth slows. Um, ultimately, we have more layoffs exceeding job creation. You know, that should go negative, and, and that could be as uh, early as Q2 of next year, but as late as Q1 of 2024. So it's a very wide band in terms of when uh, the next recession is actually declared. So, Troy, if it is that long, let's explore the terminal rate a little bit further. Mm -hmm. I mentioned this this morning. Neil Dutter of Renmac was speaking to Lisa, and he said, it puts the market's estimation of terminal interest rates at risk. As Powell has said, we don't know what the path will be, but we do know it will be enough. So, Troy, can you help me understand the upside risk here? Because I think a lot of people were getting comfortable with the idea that it was kind of five and that was it. And that was the bulk of the cycle and we were done. Yeah, look, I mean, clearly every uh, estimate, particularly from the permeable crowd and the transitory crowd, has been wrong uh, up until recently. Uh, you know, the good news is inflation has peaked, right, in terms of CPI. Still need confirmation on that in terms of PCE. But the bad news is, is it's fully spread to the labor market and services, right, which is why the Fed has to go so much harder. So, you know, our, our point to clients here is that, look, if you're going to stay at the short end of the curve, you know, focus on strategies that have uh, slightly above risk-free with tax advantages like senior secured commercial real estate debt, and if you're going to lean out further on the curve in terms of risk profile, make sure you're getting paid an abundant level of income to either tolerate higher rates or participate in higher rates. So, you know, ultimately five to five and a half at the front end and, you know, a four and a half to five percent tenure is certainly a, a reasonable part of the distribution unless inflation continues to roll over extremely hard, which we just don't see it doing given how uh, how fully embedded it is now in labor and services, which takes quarters and quarters to break, not months and months, John. Well, target's breaking, that's for sure. We're down by 15%. Sure. About five minutes into the session, and Katie Lyons, I understand we've got the microphone <laughs> dialed up for you now. It's not the first time we've seen this take place this year, is it? No, Target has had a few brutal post-earnings reactions, and this is one of them with the stock down double digits in the first few minutes of trading, John. It's so interesting to contrast Target with what we saw from Lowe's earlier today as well, which looked okay. Walmart, which looked okay. Retail sales, which say the consumer spending is actually holding in there, but Target is not experiencing it. Missed huge in the third quarter when it comes to profits, and it's cut it outlook for the top and bottom line 
decline in the holiday period. They actually think comp sales are going to decline in this holiday quarter. That would be the first time that's happened in five years. As you read the quote from the CEO, they say that this is an inflation and consumer behavior problem shifting in the face of it. But really what it comes down to is the product mix as well. If you look at the retail sales data today, you saw upticks in a lot of areas, but you didn't in general merchandise and things like electronic stores, things that Target has a little bit more exposure to apparel, for example. And as a result, they have too much inventory of things consumers no longer want as they tighten their purse strings. They have to mark down in order to work that inventory down. And that is what is weighing on profit here. And while analysts say a lot of this may be to company specific to Target. We know it is not the only company grappling with the issue of inflation. Really, companies across the board are feeling it, including in technology, where those tightening purse strings mean that customers, whether they be consumers or companies, may not be shelling out money on new hardware and tech spending or ad spending for that matter. But there's also the secondary effect of inflation, which is that central banks want to fight it by raising rates. And we know those higher rates put additional pressure on the stock of some of those technology companies as well, John. Hey, Kaylee, it's the question we'll ask all day, I guess. Is is it execution or the environment right now? Mm. Kelly Knights, thank you. Target, about six or seven minutes into the session, is down by 14%. So much news on Apple recently. The latest yesterday is that Apple was offering a discount of as much as 10% on MacBook Pros, according to businesses and Apple retail employees. The latest this morning, this from Tim Cook, the CEO. We've already made the decision to be buying out of a plant in Arizona. He's talking about chips. And this plant in Arizona starts up in 24. So we've got about two years ahead of us on that one, maybe a little less. Apple preparing to pivot from its reliance on Asian suppliers. Ed Ludlow has more on this. Hey, Ed. Yeah, it's likely that that plant is the plant TSMC is building in Arizona. Remember, we reported just last week that actually TSMC is currently building a plant in Arizona and actually plans a second. Intel is also building a plant in Arizona, but it's unlikely that Apple will pivot back to that previous supplier. We know about this because of remarks that Bloomberg News uh, has seen made by Tim Cook. He was talking to employees in Europe and also added that in the future, Apple could also move its supply chain base uh, from Asia to Europe as well. Remember, it's heavily reliant on TSMC chips produced in Taiwan as it stands. Another piece of key Apple news this morning, John, that caught my eye. Jeffrey's out with a research report saying the lockdowns in Zhengzhou, where Foxconn assembles the iPhones, could be hitting Apple to the tune of a billion dollars of lost revenue a week and shaving off about a cent of EPS for each week that passes. So that's more an issue of labor and operational supply chain disruption in the short term in that market. But if you go on EEO on the Bloomberg terminal, you can see uh, that Estimates are coming down for Apple expectations, not just for the current period, but also for full year calendar 23 uh, because of what we're seeing in the short term disruption in China. But it's interesting to see this play from Cook reacting to secure Apple's long term supply chain base. Ed, thank you, sir. The structural changes we're seeing right now, huge. We caught up with Jared Woodard yesterday at Bank of America on this. Take a listen. If we're right that we're under you know, the very early stages of a big macroeconomic shift, then the valuation reset could be substantial and it could be prolonged. Two decades, $70 trillion of assets invested for a 2% world. How many analysts, how many investors have reset their valuation models, their discounted cash flow frameworks for a world with higher interest rates, higher costs of debt, higher rollovers in the bond market? And if you do those resets, you reset those models, I think you get very different valuations of where the market is today. It's not a time to, to fade uh, what could be a major structural shift. Troy, I'd love your input on this. Jared was talking about globalization, ending, reversing, after 10 years plus of it, decades of it, low yeah, rates, decades. 2%, a world of 2%, abandoning gear, and the valuation reset, Troy, that he thinks we're only just starting to have, beginning to have, but ultimately haven't completed. Do you share that view? Yeah, 100%. And whether you look at broader markets, which have rallied back up to you know 17 to 17 and a half times forward earnings, that's only cheap in a QE world where the Fed is pumping in massive amounts of liquidity. You know, if you go back and look at longer periods of history, um, it's not cheap at all. So there's certainly more multiple compression to come after this recent uh, bear market rally. And then in terms of globalization, again, it, we still think people underestimate how critical that was not only for suppressing inflation, right? The Chinese labor market was the biggest inflation suppressant, one of the biggest reasons why the Fed struggled to get inflation above 2%. Um, so you're losing your biggest inflation suppressant, which basically means three has got to be the more rational target going forward for inflation as opposed to two. 
And secondarily, corporate profit margins of the S&P went up from five and a half to 12 to 14 percent, not driven exclusively by uh, globalization, but driven uh, in a large part by globalization and more efficient supply chains and cheaper labor and also cheaper borrowing costs. So, you know, this is a very different world. And that's why, you know, investors have to rethink their total asset allocation. The majority of your assets should still be focused on Northwest Quadrant strategies, accept lower returns, take lower risk. And if you're going to reach out for more risk, just make sure you have an abundant amount of cash flow that will help you tolerate mark to market volatility. And, and if we're dead wrong and your prior uh, segment was dead wrong and, and we did just start a new bull market, at sure. least you'll have some upside capture given how low prices are relative to the last five years. I'm trying to gauge capitulation. The yeah. client's receptive to this. Yeah, so I, I think clients, particularly over the last uh, 12 to 15 months, have recognized that, you know, ultimately a lot of the 2021 uh, gains, what we call the green light go environment, were unsustainable and that you should at least think about rotating up the capital structure and real estate and locking in gains or locking in some gains from equities. The biggest pushback, John, though, we got last year was actually taxes. You don't want to pay taxes. Ah. Like, it's like, well, that's not a problem anymore because there's a lot of tax loss harvesting. So we're seeing that more. And, and I think, you know, unfortunately in fixed income, because yields haven't been this high for so long, uh, there's been an urge to average down into oblivion and reach out for more and more duration. And, and even though, you know, the bulk of the yield moves behind this, you know, the biggest driver of returns on long duration instruments is not income. It's rate moves. And if rates continue to go higher, you can uh, withstand a pretty substantial shock. So, you know, I think gradually this realization of a, a new Fed regime, higher inflation, deglobalization is starting to resonate. It, it just takes time for people to get over, you know, a 13 year uh, Fed induced, uh, you know, asset inflation uh, extravaganza. We're deeply conditioned by it. It's deeply yes. ingrained. Troy, you've got to stick around. Troy Gajewski, I'm happy to say it's going to stick around. Equities are down four tenths on the S&P and the Nasdaq down nine tenths of one percent. Coming up, a lawsuit adding to the FTX fallout. All of that stuff, that ecosystem is going to come into the regulated institutional environment. That conversation up next. This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, the former EU ambassador to Russia. That conversation at 10 a.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. What's going to happen? All of that stuff, that ecosystem, is going to come into the regulated institutional environment because it's just too risky to sit out with a bunch of cowboys who, uh, who have managed to blow themselves up. The FTX crisis shaking confidence in the crypto world. The company and its founder, Sam Bankman-Fried, slapped with a lawsuit claiming the platform targeted, quote, unsophisticated investors. This as Genesis becomes the latest to take a hit, suspending withdrawals at its lending arm, saying it's facing, quote, abnormal withdrawal requests. Shanani Bassick on top of the story with us now. Hey, Shanani. John, as if FTX wasn't enough. Remember, when we talk about Gemini, which is the company run by the Winklevoss twins, and Genesis, which is one of the biggest players in the space, the stopping of withdrawals is a very big deal. Remember, Gemini was a company just a little while ago was offering 8% yields on an earned product, a lending product, a, a savings product, really, for customers, and now customers can't get their money back in the near term. The question is, is it the, are these solvency issues or are they liquidity issues? And what is the next shoe to drop? As far as FTX itself, you mentioned that class action lawsuit. That also includes celebrity backers, including Tom Brady, Steph, uh, Tom Brady, Steph Curry, Shaquille O'Neal, Giselle Bündchen. Listen, this is going back to this idea that these celebrity endorsers were, uh, were being used to really get to more unsophisticated investors. And that is uh, the heart of this lawsuit. Remember, more than a million creditors are named in this Chapter 11 filing that could be on the line here for money lost. In the coming days, we'll see who the top 50 creditors are and how far that exposure really goes. Cascading failures, Shanali, and the bleeding. Where does it end? Where does it stop? And how big is this iceberg? 
Between the latest announcement by Tomasic of a, almost $200, $300 million lost here, the tally for large global investors is quickly hitting a half billion dollars, could become much more as more is announced. I would also say Mike Novogratz had told me late last week after the bankruptcy filing of FTX, he thinks that the Lehman analogy of about six months after could be a good barometer here or some sort of barometer on how far we can see the contagion continuously going. Remember, more companies are at risk of bankruptcy itself, so that million customers for FTX, add on the customers that could be Im implicated here in future bankruptcies of other uh, firms tied to this, to this fallout. Shanali, thank you. Appreciate it. Great work as always. One thing you'll never see on this show, on this program, celebrities endorsing financial products. I hate it. Troy Gersky joins us right now. He's back with us. Troy, I remember your old seat when you let Bitcoin grow to, I think, plus 10 percent of the yes. overall portfolio. Can you talk to me about lessons learned at the moment over yeah. the last year? Yeah, so so I think the you know the key there's really two uh, keys to if you're going to own crypto right the first is um, are you in it for a multi-year cycle meaning you're not concerned about the four-year halving cycles you can tolerate massive levels of vol volatility you're going to stick with uh, with Bitcoin in particular which is obviously the the uh, most resilient of them all um, and then just ride out the cycles right and so there are access vehicles that allow you know, ultra high and high net worth uh, individuals to do that um, with very good custody? Or, or are you going to trade the cycles? And, you know, that's a, a very big key in that, look, if you're going to ramp up risk or take risk down, you know, Bitcoin historically has had very defined cycles around the halving point. Um, when Bitcoin halves, new supply is cut in half. Uh, this cycle was exceptionally driven by Fed policy as well. So that uh, can lead to very big gains. But then the downside, of course, is when, um, when uh, supply continues out at a pace regardless of price, uh, you can have these um, disastrous bear markets, which has been the history of, of uh, crypto. And there's no reason to expect that to change. So we think the next uh, attractive entry point could be late 23, early 24, around the next halving. And then it's just a question for investors in terms of their risk profile. If they're going to make a very tiny allocation and can ride it through a cycle, no problem. Just accept that you're going to have higher highs and higher lows and wild volatility. Uh, but actively you know, trading around the peaks of the cycle and the declines for more active investors make, makes a lot of sense. Troy, how does the reputational risk assessment factor into the risk reward assessment? For a, yeah, per, from so a personal think... standpoint, for an individual right now like yourself, who would yeah. put money into, say, a questionable platform that blows up like these have in the past. Do you have to take account of that a little bit more? I, I think so, and I think that's probably one of the bigger surprises about this cycle, especially with the uh, evolution of institutional custody at places like Fidelity or Nidig or, or Galaxy that really made it accessible for institutions. Um, the fact that you still have this prevalence of bad actors um, which, you know, obviously there's no other way to describe FTX than that. Uh, it's a real stain uh, on not only uh, the crypto community, but also, you know, those that, that funded it. And it's really, really unfortunate. So I think, you know, going forward, what that could mean from a price standpoint is uh, the next halving cycle takes longer to get going because it might take three, six, nine months to wash through this current saga. And that's going to greatly reduce the uh, willingness and ability for institutions to invest. And then furthermore, John, this is back to this whole concept of cash flow as king now. You know, this is an environment like 20 or early 21 where most assets were expensive, yields were low, um, and you were playing for positive convexity upside to the Fed. This is an environment now where, you know, whether it's uh, closed-end funds like FSCO or listed BDCs like FSK, offer exceptionally high yield. So if you're, if you're going to take risk, at least get paid cash flow, whereas in 20 and early 21, you know, a lot of those opportunities weren't present. Um, so very different market environment today. So if you're an institution, like, are you going to buy the 10 year at three and a half or four? Are you going to buy high yield at 10? Are you going to buy closed end funds? Are you going to buy senior secured commercial real estate debt? Or are you going to risk some reputation on stretching for yield, or sorry, stretching for return sure. in crypto? Much tougher call. Right now, you're not going to make that call, that's for sure, given what's played that's out in the sure. last week. Troy, I know you've got a new credit strategy, and this is the tease for next week. We're going to talk about it 
next Wednesday. Troy Kajewski of FS Investments there. Want to squeeze in some sector price action. Abby, stocks are lower. Break it down for us. Yeah, very interesting, John. We do have the S&P 500 down about six tenths of one percent. Low volume. Sector wise, it's very interesting because eight of the 11 sectors are down. But the three sectors that are up, that's true defense, utilities, healthcare, consumer staples. Of course, discretionary being weighed on by Target. The nice to have not weighing out on the need to have. And then Advance Auto also down about 15 percent. It's worst day since March of 2020. Abby, thank you. Stock's a little softer than your trading down. Up next. The moves in these markets, phenomenal. Equities lower by six tenths of one percent on the S&P and the Nasdaq down by more than one percent. Take a look at the gap in the bond market between a two year and a 10 year. That gap, deep, deep inversion, negative 63 basis points, twos versus tens right now. Post retail sales. That's the price action. Let's get you the trading diary. Fed Vice Chair for Supervision, Michael Barr, test the fang on Capitol Hill at the top of the hour. Fed Governor Wallace speaking at 2.30 Eastern time. Another round of claims coming tomorrow morning, and we'll hear from the Fed even more. Bullard, Bauman, Mester, Jefferson, Kashkari, Hall on deck. Then on to Friday, existing home sales and Fed President Collins speaking to round out the week. From New York City, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.